well, good morning. <laughs> so it's been said that at the end of the world, only two things will remain, cockroaches and styrofoam. I don't know what to do about cockroaches, but I do know what to do about styrofoam. Aeroclay is an advanced materials platform that's comprised primarily of clay represented in green polymers or the purple noodles and then water are the things that are evaporating and when all of that is mixed together frozen and then freeze dried all that's left after the freeze drying process is the air where the ice used to be so it's a very light insulative material whose qualities are controlled by the polymers that are used with the clay. The problems we face today as we've heard this morning are primarily pollution. There's no universal solution for all of these issues, but aeroclay can address many of them. We have pollution in our waters and our oceans, inefficiency in our homes and in our buildings. There's sustainability issues with our farming, hazardous packaging and industrial waste. All of those are things that aeroclay can address. Oil spills happen to be one of the largest problems that we see because it's when those events occur, they're so uh, um, well publicized and they're of such a grave nature. In the U.S. alone, there's over a billion gallons of oil spilled every year. Insulating materials. We see fires because insulating materials are not flame resistant, nor are they biodegradable. Many are not as effective as they could be. For farming materials, we need time-released fertilizers that now require multiple applications and multiple different types of uh, fertilizers to dis be dispensed uh, numerous times as they're applied. Packaging protection. Many of you have probably seen this uh, picture of a beautiful UPS plane that was on the tarmac. Thank goodness it was not in the air. A lithium-ion bi battery in defective packaging combined to cause this uh, fire. Our packaging is not chemically absorbent, nor is it flame resistant. Aeroclay can fix those sorts of problems. In master batch uh, formulations, traditional additives don't disperse well, and there are adverse rheological properties that occur. All of these things, in my mind, tend to be a materials problem, materials pollution, and they, they boil down to environmental issues. That are, there are issues of toxicity, manufacturing waste, and a lack of recyclability. From a regulatory point of view, things like styrofoam are being banned now and it's primarily because of the blowing agents that are used in that manufacturing process. Aeroclay is an open cell foam-like material that is used, it's made with a green process, it's fire retardant, it is absorbent, it's biodegradable, and because of the way that it's manufactured, it can be combined into any of these properties to yield very customized solutions. As I said, it's a platform solution where its absorptive capabilities can be used to clean our oceans, its insulation qualities can be used for better building insulation, it's biodegradable, which leads it to be a great solution for sustainable farming, it's flame retardant, which will lead to safer packaging, and in its master batch formulations, it can help us clean our industrial waste. It's made with a very benign, friendly, green manufacturing process, and as you can see in this slide, the clay and polymer are mixed together with water. That solution in the middle green block represents that it's then frozen, and then that frozen material is freeze dried, and in the freeze drying process, the ice is sublimed out of that material, leaving behind air pockets where the ice used to be. And so you can see across the bottom of the screen that same uh, sequence where it's a simple solution of polymer, water, and clay that's frozen, and then once it's sublimed, all that is left is the clay and polymer structure. From a more realistic uh, perspective, in terms of photographs, this is a lab process. You can see it starts with the clay. The polymer solution is added. All of that is uh, blended together into a gel. We call it a smoothie. And then that smoothie is frozen. And as you can see in the uh, bottom left uh, photograph there, you can go, now go home and tell everyone that you've actually literally seen dirt freeze that's taken with a uh, microscopic camera. And uh, as you can see, once the dirt is frozen, the way that it's frozen begins to give aeroclay its very specific morphology. Here are more uh, realistic pictures of how that works. 
you can see that in the uh, three different photographs, you can actually freeze these gels in different ways depending on the plates upon which they're frozen. And those freezing effects uh, uh, give the products its morphology and its uh, performance characteristics. The other controlling element in the manufacturing process is the specific polymer that's mixed with the freezing process. And so you can see a variety of different types of uh, structures here, everything from layered structures to honeycomb structures, the result from the combination of the freezing process and the particular polymer that was used in combination with the way that it was frozen. For current applications, we're really dividing it into three groups. We think of it in terms of foam applications, pellet applications, and sponge applications. Going back to the oil spill example, just because it's uh, so noteworthy, you could take oil, uh, aeroclay, toss it off the back of a boat onto an oil spill in the ocean. It will collect up to 50 times its weight in oil. It can then be brought back onto the boat, wrung out, the oil is reclaimed, and then you can toss the aeroclay back out onto the ocean where it can be used up to 20 more times before beginning to lose any significant amount of its efficiency. In this uh, little clip, you can see we're in the lab. Aeroclay is put on the water. It's picked up. It's wrung out. That oil can be reclaimed. And you can see from the uh, remainder parts that are in his hand how easily it could be used just to rebroadcast that out onto the ocean and to pick up more oil. Aeroclay is flame resistant. In this test, you can see that a Bunsen burner on the underside of this very thin piece of aeroclay, it merely chars some of the material. And what's left at the end, the crayons are not hurt at all. In fact, you can put your hand on top of that and you'd feel virtually no heat. In a master batch formulation, because it's biodegradable and the rate at which biodegradation takes place can be controlled, then we can have an immediate release where if you wanted all of the active ingredient to be released into the environment at one time, that can happen. Or with different formulations of aeroclay wrapped around different active ingredients, those different pieces could biodegrade over time, and so you can see its application in a farming application. We're beginning to get a lot of uh, media attention for aeroclay. In fact, uh, the economist was touting it because those proteins that are used, the polymers that are used are actually proteins, and many of them, uh, in this example, were uh, casein, which is a form of spoiled milk. Uh, packaging Digest is uh, very enthusiastic about it because of its packaging characteristics. And of course, National Geographic has uh, sponsored it as one of three of the future oil fighters of uh, oil spills. So it's a uh, technology platform. It's designed for sustainable packaging, for sustainable farming, in its pelletized forms, it can clean oceans, it can lead to more efficient housing and uh, safer packaging. The market opportunity here on a global basis is about $130 billion of foam products used per year. About half of those are polyurethane, a quarter is polystyrene, and then the other remaining quarter is uh, other foam alternatives. The ones we're focused on at the moment are merely U.S. components in those areas that we've been talking about. And as you can see from the graphic, they're all quite large markets that uh, primarily involve ocean cleanup, insulation, farming, and master batch materials along with packaging. In order to capture those potentials within our system, the way that we're going to go at this is direct offerings directly to consumers of premium products at premium prices. We'll also offer licensing opportunities on a commodity-based level to large manufacturers. Sliced and diced a different way, when we look at the foam, sponge, and pellet applications, we're really thinking of packaging as the initial premium product for our foam applications and for the absorptive capabilities. For the sponge capabilities, think of uh, individual packets of this material that can be used either in your home or on a shop floor to clean up uh, all sorts of chemical problems. And in the pelletized form, perhaps packages of uh, aeroclay wrapped time-release fertilizers that you can use in your home garden. On the industrial scale, they simply build to a commoditized level so that you have uh, industrial applications of foam, 
of sponges for oil spills and of time release fertilizers for sustainable farming. In our view, an advanced material, no matter how good it is, is really nothing in and of itself if there's not a team behind it to make that flow. So we're focused on three things simultaneously. One is determining exactly what people need. What are the design and engineering characteristics of the products that they want and that they can use? How are we going to provide that material at a scaled level that will drive down cost? And how will we get that there when they want it delivered where they want it delivered. The patented uh, technology of AeroClay was developed at Case Western Reserve University. AeroClay LLC holds a global exclusive license for its commercialization. It holds five patents in the Canada, the United States, and Europe, one in Japan. All of these have to do with its uh, processes and manufacture, and additional patents are pending around the world. The AeroClay team is uh, comprised of a group of very well-known scientists led by Dr. David Giraldi. He is the chairman of the Department of Macromolecular Engineering at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland. He's joined by a group of uh, dedicated scientists, including Dr. Yuxin Wang, who is here with us today, and of course, an experienced team of entrepreneurs who uh, intend to commercialize these products. If we were fortunate enough to win the Ocean Exchange Award, we would dedicate those funds to additional lab capabilities. We're supported by Case Western Reserve and their lab, lab capabilities now. There are a number of people in the Austin area where we're from who do uh, freeze drying for drug use and other commercial applications. We can use those facilities to do all sorts of uh, tests and to build prototypes, but we'd really like to bring our own uh, materials in-house to do that. One of the most important slides we have, we see in terms of our duty, our responsibility, we call that stewardship. We want to be good stewards of this technology. As a, uh, uh, we said this morning, there's the people, the planet, and the profits all have to be tended to. We think of it in terms of economics, our community, and our environmental issues, and it's where those areas overlap that we see points of inflection that we really need to be uh, cognizant of, and that's where our responsibilities really lie. And so in the overlap between our community and our business interest, we have to have equitable solutions. Between the overlap between the environment and our communities, we need to have healthy solutions. And of course, in our businesses, we have to be sustainable both environmentally and from a profit perspective, and those are all desirable characteristics. In order to carry that out, this is such a grand plan and such a fantastic uh, adoptable, customizable solution. We need collaboration with open-minded people, like-minded people from around the world so that this uh, can truly be brought to a grand scale and fulfill the potential that it has. We call that singular impact exponential returns. And this graphic is intended to show just the example that we have here today of ocean exchange bringing together the potential for us to develop these products those products are then disseminated to a number of people around the world who are consumers who use these things. And intentionally or not, they end up helping us each examine our little three minutes parts of the earth so that in the end we really have an exponential return from something very small that started here today. So AeroClay, in our minds, does deliver singular, uh, singular impact, exponential returns, and we truly are translating sustainability into value. I'm Gordon from AeroClay, and I thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions? So can you talk a little bit about the economics of uh, the system relative to the existing alternatives in the market? Um, you're, you did say you're coming in at a premium, but how much of a premium? Um, what does the differential look like in the um, absorption materials, the performance uh, over the life? Is this uh, fundamentally better because it is environmentally um, sustainable, or is it also economically sustainable on top of that? And how does this relate in farming, which is this time release is relatively new? Yes. 
in the normal course of developing technology, particularly a materials technology, if you think back, uh, things like molded pulp, when it first came on the market, people said, well, that's too expensive. It's very energy intensive to uh, manufacture pulp. But over the years that it's been there, it now is very competitive as an alternative to many foams. Uh, integrated circuit boards started out that way. Tremendously expensive, very specific uses for it. And now they're in almost everything that we do. So the normal course is a premium product of some type and then as uh, manufacturing scales up and adoption occurs, prices go down. And so uh, that's why we chose to begin with some very specific premium products. In a way, they're really pilots that enable us to take those to a grander scale. Uh, for one of our primary, uh, I wouldn't call it a competitor, I love styrofoam. I drink out of styrofoam cups every day. My wife fusses at me, tells me it's gonna kill me if I keep doing that. It's being banned in many cities across the country, especially for food uses. And so that we have to find a replacement for that. At the moment, uh, AeroClay probably costs five to 10 times what styrofoam cost. But AeroClay will do so many more things than styrofoam. Styrofoam is not biodegradable. It's gonna be here for another 50,000 years. Uh, it is not flame retardant. It will burn, and when it burns, it gives off toxic gases. Aeroclay, because it's uh, biological and it's uh, sustainable, uh, has none of those issues. And so it's the mix and match of these combinations of the qualities of Aeroclay that make it a more valuable product. It's not, it can be a very broad product in terms of its application, but it also can be very specific. And when someone needs a very specific solution, then those cost differences become remarkably smaller. If you have questions while someone's asking, please come up to the microphone and just be waiting. Somebody got a question there? Hi. Um, Patrick Bentley from the Savannah Economic Development Authority. Yes. So I had, a, I guess, two questions for you. First, I wanted to know about your timeline in terms of the other companies. You said you need 50 companies, 10 different countries. Can you talk a little bit more about that timeline? And also, uh, what, what kind of, or what, what would be the location for those companies? Um, I think this could have some great implications for Savannah because of having Hardy Advanced Materials here and uh, because of where we are logistically. And I'd like for you to talk a little bit more about that. Sure. Uh, Aeroclay LLC has been in existence for about a year and a half or two years. The technology was actually developed at Case Western Reserve University. Uh, They've had it, I think, since 2003 or so and have continued to work on it in the background. They continue to do research on it. And so it's, uh, oh, what is that, 10 years old at this point. There are numerous articles that say to develop a materials technology as opposed to a gizmo or a gadget, uh, that those things take up to 20 years to actually become uh, ubiquitous and adopted worldwide. So our timeline uh, is closing on us. It's another 10 years. We've actually received these inquiries over the past uh, 18 months or so. And so it's beginning to accelerate, and we need to accelerate it further. Let me just point out we have microphones at, at both sides here, so don't have to gather in the middle. Go ahead. Thank you for your presentation. I'm not clear whether the other polymers, you mentioned casein, and that's a, an obvious case in terms of biodegradability. But what about other polymers? Were those, are those also basically protein-derived and biodegradable, or can you say a little more about that? Sure. The uh, polymers that are used in aeroclay uh, really depend on the specific use to which uh, the aeroclay material is going to be applied. And it depends on the, the <laughs> desires of the customer and where they would like to end up. That also dictates cost. For example, the oil spill cleanup materials have uh, synthetic polymers in them. So in and of themselves, there are non-biodegradable elements, but they're far better than the ones that we have today. And the parts that are not biodegradable are easily captured, because you can see it's all uh, returned. Those uh, polymers burn as fuels, because they're then, at that point, uh, the entire material is oil laden and so they're a very good uh, fuel source even though not biodegradable. We have a question over here. The, the product's biodegradability and its end of life speak to the sustainability of the product. 
but if you go back to the beginning where uh, you have to mine clay, you have the logistics of moving the polymer and the clay, you've got the freezing. Can you speak to the cradle to grave life, life cycle sustainability of the product? Yes, uh, in terms of cradle to grave, I would say that uh, things like the polystyrenes never reach the grave. They're always there. These products, the cradle to grave parts happen uh, over the period of time dictated by the customer's need. That doesn't mean that they can uh, stay out there forever if they're purely biodegradable. We call it backyard compostable. So many of them are uh, short-term uses. The things that would wrap around fertilizers, for example, are a much shorter term use, but they're really dictated by the customer need. Uh, for a complete life cycle cradle to cradle sort of, of a solution, nowadays uh, I see that BASF was here yesterday. Uh, they have what is now called, referred to as a materials bank, so that when you have materials that uh, can be uh, reused, then they uh, collect those materials across the country or across the world put them into a bank and people who have contributed those materials then free to withdraw them. And so if we have things that are in our aeroclay materials that can be reused, then the potentials for a materials bank are squarely in front of us and within our thinking. Here in the center. Yes, you mentioned that during spill cleanup that you could redeploy very easily the same materials. Um, if you're doing that while you're out on the boat, is there any concern or any addressing of cross-contamination concerns? I'm not, uh, I'm not really you clear. You have on. sensitive coral reefs and things like that, oh, so yes. if they're indiscriminately putting it back out, they could actually recontaminate if there's two ways it can flow in and out of the material. Yes, what's uh, in an oil spill situation, for example, on the ocean, when you put the aeroclay material out, it floats, it does not sink, and so it wouldn't be going to the bottom of the ocean. And in fact, it helps keep the oil up on the surface where it can be scooped up, squeezed out, the oil's recaptured, and then the uh, aeroclay material that's thrown back out onto the ocean, as I said, it's good for another 20 or so uses, continues to float. So none of that oil is allowed to sink to contaminate uh, the ocean floor or reefs or things of that sort. So none of the um, slow release would take place in that particular situation like you were using in the agricultural issue. Right. Those are completely separate fields. The uh, slow release characteristics are something that are built in with the polymer to dissolve okay. over a long Different period Different formulation of time. Yes. then. Great. Exactly. That's what I wanted to know. Thank yes. you. Uh -huh. All of that, again, is controlled by the freezing and by the polymer, and so those two factors combined are what uh, gives it so many opportunities and so many, so many different formulations. You're on over here. Uh, packaging is inherently, you know, not efficient in terms of, of um, about, um, you know, creating like styrofoam masses and things like that. With your product, you know, as it builds up, it, can it be used for repackaging again, or is it a one-shot deal as far as packaging? Um, uh, that you're using, let's say, for a product or from a safety aspect or anything else like that? Yes, it's uh, totally reusable. As uh, you saw in some of the pictures, there's a number of different morphologies or ways that the uh, uh, product appears. It can be a honeycomb or it can be a foam. We'd invite you to come by our table. We have some samples there that you can feel. Some of them are uh, very crispy. Uh, there, you can see the capillaries that are in the material that give it its sponge-like effect. Others of them are very rubbery, and they feel like a piece of, uh, piece of rubber or a piece of rubber foam. And so the specific needs of the, uh, to carry those uh, materials that are in a package can be addressed with different formulations of aeroclay. All of them, though, would be a safe formulation and can be reused. Over here. Yes, Mr. McGill. My name is Peter Kleach with Rubicon Global. And I manage all the uh, recycling organic material in North America, uh, North America Mexico, and uh, Puerto Rico. Uh, we currently manage a lot of organic waste streams that are contaminated with styrene. And if it were not, we'd be able to recycle that material and save that generator a substantial amount of money, which would most likely make up the four to five times cost of uh, the styrene. But I just wanted to tell you, there are some markets across the country I'd like to speak with you maybe after your presentation about that. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. I have seen, uh, just as a general comment, articles about uh, uh, ways that we can recapture polystyrene and then reuse it. 
many people feel that because of the way that it's manufactured, you can't uh, recapture it. It's, it. It actually costs more to transport it back to a recycle shop than the material is worth. And so it's uh, gotten to be like TVs. When it goes bad, you throw it away instead of trying to do something to re repair it. Uh, they are developing new ways to squish the uh, polystyrene and to uh, compact it on site before it's transported. And so I'm hopeful that uh, there actually will be ways that polystyrene can be recycled. But at th this point in time, because of cost factors, it's uh, not been very successful. Gordon, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Gordon thank McGill, Aero Clay. Thank you.